Our scripture starts with Jeremiah, chapter 9. The prophet is not prophesying so much as encouraging here. Thus says the Lord, do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. But let those who boast, boast in this, that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord, I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. From 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to abolish things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God to you with superior speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not made with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. This is our reading for the morning. Well, the passage today from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Christians in Corinth which we often read so nonchalantly, turned the perspective of the then listening world on its ear. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Can that be true? Do we believe it? If these are not just clever words, but descriptions of reality, then we better listen a little closer. God chose what is foolish. God chose what is weak. We try so hard not to be foolish and weak, and we hide it when we are, when we truly are. You know, we can, I don't even know, maybe Paul might have been feigning some of that, like I'm a humble guy, I'm a humble guy, I don't know. But when we're doing that, we get a lot of courage from that. But when we truly feel weak and humble, when we truly feel foolish, it's hard to let it show. We want to be accomplished, wise, and in control of life. Could foolishness and weakness actually be God's preference? Well, Paul certainly knew something about this from firsthand experience. On the road to Damascus to persecute the Christians, he was blinded and his life took a 180 degree turn. No longer would he be the powerful man on the horse, a man named Saul, directing the matters of his world. But now as Paul, he was a man thrown to the ground in blindness. Later, he would be imprisoned for his Christian faith, broken and humbled to serve God. In 1947, the English painter Cecil Collins wrote a book entitled The Vision of the Fool in which he explored the role of the artist, the fool, in the modern world of war and industrialization. Collins was seen at this time as England's greatest visionary artist since William Blake. Let's take another look at that cover of the, you got your cover? How do you like that fool? That's one of his pieces. Any comments, anything anybody notices they wanna share? Yeah, Anya, real loud. Okay, I can't hear you. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. I guess I better not have you talk because it's too hard unless you're going to shout. Anybody got to shout something? Jason, you don't notice anything? I got nothing. I got nothing. Okay. <laughs> Certainly there's a sloth quality. Steve, you must. What do you mean, I must? I know. <laughs> it's like a Rip Van Winkle thing. Oh, yeah. A Rip Van Winkle quality. I just think we wanted to take a minute with this before we went on talking about it. One of these images of the fool on the bulletin cover today, I, you got, I guess you got that. Blake saw the fool as the poetic imagination of life. He wrote, modern society has succeeded very well in rendering poetic imagination, art, and religion the three magical representatives of life as heresy. This was in what, 1947, huh? The fool appeared in many of Cecil's paintings and prints as an innocent figure who, although having no place in modern society, has the vision which is necessary to find fulfillment and eventual reward. He concluded that the saint, the artist, the poet, and the fool are one. Play with that one a while. Hmm? Now, what might these four have in common, the saint, the artist, the poet, and the fool? Well, let's go back to Paul's words to the Christians in Corinth. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Jason, were you trembling a little bit up here? No? I think all of us get up here trembling a little bit. I decided to know nothing is clearly a phrase about becoming a fool. Paul became a fool for Christ. The work of the saint, the artist, the poet, and the fool remind us of this saving truth. They remain present and open to the world. These four remain present and open to the world around them, spending their days and their years receptive to the call of beauty and the call of the divine. They see the hypocrisy of the world and the falseness with which they themselves personally struggle. I've always been struck by the deep humility which is visible, almost palpable in truly great people. Ever had that thought? Yeah? Just so very powerfully humble because they say in something that they, that they know is beyond them. They do not try to avoid appearing foolish. They don't try not to stumble or sound uncertain or even irrational. The truth is they bear is bigger than they are and the egotism has little value for them, little place in their lives. Often the world doesn't recognize true greatness until it is gone. Or the world is threatened by the thoughts and actions of great people. All too frequently, their truth, which can potentially turn our world upside down, makes us so anxious that we seek to silence them, worse, to villainize them, often to kill them. In this violently topsy-turvy world where truth is no longer valued, where events are rebranded to frame lies into truth, where life-defined political positions are held as if they were holy scripture, which then are used to justify hatefulness, injustice, cruelty, where all that matters to many is getting and holding on to power. Perhaps the fool, the poet, the artist offer our greatest hope for the future. Even in these times where technology appears to be the more efficient and productive path, well, the fool, the artist, the poet, still speak and people still listen. Let's look at this expressed simply in a child's fairy tale. Anybody got a guess which one I'm going for? Shout it. Do you remember the story of the emperor's new clothes by Hans Christian Andersen? The king, with the one with power, believes that he has a magic outfit that can only be seen by intelligent people. When he walks down the street, no one is willing to admit that the king is naked. That's the guy with power, remember? 
for fear they'll be called stupid and worse. Only a small child with his innocent, clear vision and uncorrupted soul yells out over the crowd, the king isn't wearing anything. What could we say about the king, huh? Wouldn't that be fun? Sue says a lot of it online. <laughs> The child in this story is a holy fool. If we listen carefully to the children around us, we might notice that most children in many ways, before being taught by skeptics and so-called realists, are holy fools, whose innocent honesty holds a naive wisdom. Maybe we should add child to the end of that list. The common theme among the saint, the artist, the poet, the fool, is a radical honesty and openness to mystery and a willingness to stand naked in the ministry. Oh, I like that. To stand naked in the mystery, not to answer what cannot be answered or control what cannot be controlled. Oh, we try so hard. In this profound humility, the saint, the artist, the poet, and the fool become porous to the world around them, taking it in and holding its pain holding its contradictions, its beauty, and ultimately, if they stay true, it's deep peace. For when the spirit enters any of us, <coughs> when the voice of the soul is heard, we too develop a bit, a bit of the honesty of the saint, the artist, the poet, and the fool. Even if we can't manage to rise to the capacity of the first three, at least we can become a fool for love and truth and the prophetic and compassionate messages of great religions throughout time. The great educator Parker Palmer once told a story. He, he by the way, was a melancholic, a depressive even. I remember talking with a friend who has worked for many years at the Catholic Worker, a ministry to the poor in New York City. Daily, she tries to respond to waves of human mystery, min, mis, misery that are as ceaseless as surf in that community. Out of my deep not knowing, I asked her how she could keep doing a work that never showed any results. <laughs> Sound familiar? A work in which the problems keep getting worse instead of better. I will never forget her enigmatic answer. The thing you don't understand, Parker, is that just because something is impossible doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Foolish, huh? <coughs> well, I think I'll stop there. I bet you love those words, right? <laughs> That's all I know to say. Maybe I said even more than I really know. I often do. Each week as I step up here to speak to you, my best hope is that I can access something of the spirit of the Holy Fool. Using the artistry of words, receiving the wisdom of the poetry of this world on my own journey toward a more compassionate and mature faith. So now as we enter into the holy mystery of the Eucharist, the Last Supper, Holy Communion, where we openly, some say blindly, acknowledge that the bread and the cup hold divine power to connect us to sacred truth and to transform our own lives and the life of the world. Let us come to the table as holy fools. The United Church of Christ theme for this year, for this year's stewardship program is from bread and cup to faith and serving and giving, excuse me, we'll do that again, from bread and cup to faith and giving. May this sacred ritual and the daily practice of our faith lead us into a world where justice, compassion, and truth are again revered. Amen.